to start with the fitrah because I think it's a good place to start. Um, Maulana has mentioned like Ibn Taymiyyah and like he spoke about the fitrah and all these kind of things. And it's not just Ibn Taymiyyah, like I, I've read a lot of things about Al Ghazali as well, his discussion of the fitrah and many in the Ash'ari school. And the really the fitrah has been described in many different ways. Is there is not actually one definition of it. But if we take the opinion of let's say Ibn Taymiyyah and Al Ghazali and the and most of the theologians. It's the idea that you have an instinct to believing in God. It's, it's not an argument per se. There's no proposition. It's not like premise one, premise two, premise three, therefore God exists. It's, it's an instinct. In fact, what Ibn Taymiyyah mentions about it is that when you're born as a child, you have an instinct to suckling the breast of your mother. No one teaches you, okay, this is how you do it, you know. Come here, young child. This is how you suck the breast of the mother. The, the, the baby knows instinctively how to suck the breast of the mother. And just like that, we also know instinctively that God exists. Now, you might think this is very flimsy, but the truth is the majority of cognitive scientists actually have made this point now. And I made this point to Jordan Peterson uh, and I keep mentioning his name, and this individual is called Justin Barrett. He's from the Oxford Anthropological Society. And in 2011, they done a big study, 32,000 children, you know, and they, they wanted to see whether these children, what they believe before they are socialized, meaning before their parents, you know, try and convince them of a religion. And the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, kullu mawludun yuladu ala fitrati that every young child is born on the fitrah, this idea of a predisposition to believing in God. And then his parents, you know, Yuhawidani, they, they make him into a Jew or a, a, a Magian or a, a Nasrani, a, a Christian. So in other words, he's socialized thereafter. So this is the Islamic thesis. But the reality is, this is something now which has pretty much been confirmed by cognitive science. I was quite astounded, actually. I was reading, and I sent this to Jordan Peter because I had some discussions with him, some private discussions. And I actually sent him the, 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 the page. I said, you know, this is where it's mentioned. And, and he was very intrigued as well. Because cognitively, it's clear that we are born, not just believing in God, by the way. We are born making meaning out of things all the time. Purpose, the teleos. So when we look at something, as children especially, we ask the question, what is it for? Like, what's the, what is the cloud for? What is the table for? What is, the, what is it for? What is the meaning? What is the purpose of the thing? All right, so we, we are creatures of meaning. It's a very natural thing to believe that there, are, there is meaning in inanimate things, let alone animate things, things which have no life. So when we look at things, we think, yeah, this, is, this has meaning. So then the question would be, what is the purpose of life itself? To which, of course, an atheist, an, a naturalist, materialist atheist has no answer. They could say, yeah, you, you do have a purpose of life, but it's subjective. Everyone makes their own purpose. It's love. It's, uh, you know, making people happy. It's whatever it is. But this is not a, an objective anchored answer. It's not like two plus two equals four, where there's one answer that everyone can kind of refer back to. So what the tradition has been saying for all these years has actually been confirmed. That we are born as creatures of meaning, creatures of purpose, with an instinct to believing in God. It's the natural state. We are not born, we are not born, no study on the face of the planet that I know of, and I've seen a lot of them, has ever said that we are born atheistic. That we are born with no conception of a, a higher power or a, or, or a divine being. No study has shown that. Now, we're not saying, therefore, God exists. We're not making an argument, therefore, God exists. But we are just recognizing the natural state of the human being. This is the natural state of the human being. And the Islamic paradigm is clearer in being able to describe that natural state. That's the first point. The second point is, the question is, to what extent is atheism a problem in the first place? Because we may think as Muslims that, you know, all these non-Muslims out there that are not Christians, they're atheists. But demographic studies have shown us that this is not the case. Yes, it is the case 
that now, because every 10 years in this country, they have something called a census. Okay? You might have, uh, you have, you might have had to kind of answer questions when you get the census, and sometimes they give you a fine if you don't do it and whatever. And we have a good turnout for the census, yeah? In some countries, it's actually illegal not to fill it out. And it's the strongest data that we have on religion in this country. There's about 77 million people in this country, nearly 80 maybe now. 80 million. And every 10 years, they see how many Muslims are there, how many Christians are there, and so on. Yeah. Now, it's true to say that in 2001, when they done the census, we found that there was about 54% Christian or something like that. I mean, don't quote me on the exact figure, but something in the 50s. And then, sorry, it was something in the 70s, in 2001. And then something in, in 2011, so 10 years later, it was somewhere in the 50s. So there was about a 22% decline, okay? So people left Dhamridda, apostasy from Christianity, like 22% of the country, which is shocking. That's never happened in history in this country, ever. This is a highly significant event. If, if you guys know about how Christianity came into this country, it came into the country about 5th century, okay? missionaries and so on it came into the country although this country was part of the roman empire we are talking about from that time about sixth century onwards there's never been such a rapid decline in christian belief in i would say 1500 years the, the the same age as islam itself think of that so what's happened in the last 10 years has been the most remarkable movement away from religion for the last 1500 years which is a millennia, millennia and a half. Yeah? 22% of the country done rid death from the religion. Left Christianity. Now, 10 years later, we don't actually have the census data for, for 2021, by the way. But that's going to come out in May, which is maybe two months from now, whatever, two, three months from now, yeah? It's predicted that the number is below 50%, somewhere in the 40s, maybe even in the 30s. Now, you imagine there's like 20 years ago, or whatever it was, there were 70 something percent Christians in the country, and then now there's 30 something percent. That's like half. But what are they becoming? They are not necessarily becoming atheists. And this is a very important point. The, the, the details that we have, and I've written something on this, uh, you can get it from the Sapiens Institute you know, website. I called it the scientific deceptions of a new atheist. Uh, a particular professor called Linda Woodhead, she has probably the best data on this and there's something called the british attitude surveys which according along with the census is the best thing we have yeah and it shows that in this country about five six seven years ago which is when the data was last collected the amount of what was referred to as strident atheists like people who really say we don't believe in god not agnostic because agnostic will say i don't know you ask them would well, you believe in god do you believe in religion they say, i don't know the word itself means I don't, from agnostos, meaning having no knowledge of something, yeah? But if you ask in, yeah, how many people, oh, let me ask you guys, let me, let, me bring the, let me bring the crowd into this. How much of a percentage do you think this country is strident atheist? There's this young man in the front, I'm going to pick on you people. You want to put your hands up? I'm going to pick. Go on, what's your name, first of all? Adam, how much percentage do you think? 28%? Okay. Uh, how about you, young man in the front? Say any number you like. 38. He went for you and higher. All right. How about the sisters? Oh, you're not used to being uh, questioned, huh? 10%. Okay. That's, get, that's actually closer. Any other guesses? You? Yes. 15. All right. It's 5%. 5%. Which, which interestingly enough, is the same number of Muslims in this country according to the 2011 census. Therefore, we conclude there is the same number of atheists in this country as there is Muslims. Strident atheists, positive atheists, that's very significant because already we have crushed the Frankenstein. We think everyone's an atheist. Wait, there's, a, there's as much of us as there is of them? Wait a minute, how confident do you feel? I talk about confidence. Already they've shrunk enough. They're nothing now. It's like, a, sorry, it's like someone's going to, have a fight with you and then they take off their shirt and you see they're kind of out of shape <laughs> and you know what we're talking about because you guys do bjj and there's a lot of people that fit that profile <laughs> i'm only kidding <laughs> you know 
The point is, that's the first thing. The first thing we need to realize is, they're not as big a threat as you think. In 2010, like 10 years ago, I'm not sure if you remember as well, but they were quite loud on, uh, on social media, on the, on the internet, on TV. You see Richard Dawkins stumping this person and, and humiliating that person. According to the stats that we've actually carried out, the Islamic Dawah is now overtaken the new atheist movement. This is actually a fact. When I say overtaken, I'm talking about numbers. There are more people watching and interested in the Islamic Dawah than there are people and watching the new atheist movement. I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to brag or something. Wallahi, this is the case. I actually had a conversation with Sam Harris where he uh, abjured from the conversation and ran away, quaked in his boots, as you use the term, <laughs> ran away. He's meant to be one of the figureheads. I was on Twitter and asked him a few questions. He ran away. This is meant to be the, the big shot. I was just having a conversation with, with one academic in a university. And yes, I was in the University of Oxford at one point, yeah? And when I mentioned Richard Dawkins, people snigger and laugh. This guy, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a joke. It's a, come on. It's, it's, it's so interesting how individuals like that, which we laugh at and brush off as, as fools and incompetent, in fact. Michael Roos, who is a philosopher in his own right, an atheist and one of the leading philosophers of science in this country. When he was commenting on Richard Dawkins, he said that he's like a child. He's... He, he's, he's an embarrassed, I'm, he makes me embarrassed to be an atheist. That's what he said. But this person who other atheists are saying, he, he makes me embarrassed to be an atheist, top grade philosophers, and laughing at him in the universities, is, is, is putting fear into the hearts of you. It's the problem is not with atheism. The problem is actually with a, a mentality that you have, that we have. And it's a mentality of a colonial inferiority complex we think the white man is better than us that's really what it is that's what it boils down to wallahi we think a lot of it especially in subcontinental uh, uh, asia if you're pakistani if you're these uh, nations they are the most colonized fikran, fikran. they have the they think when they see white they think right even in my country i'm from egypt it's not as bad <laughs> you know what i'm talking about it's not as bad, but I went to the pharmacy one time from where I'm from, Alexandria. The best place in Egypt, of course. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I went inside and I saw something. It said, it's like a picture of a woman and, you know, stuff like that, you know. But it said, this was like a cream that you put on. Guess what it was called? Be white. Literally, no hesitation. <laughs> be white. We don't just want to be white by skin color. We want to be white by ideology. We do think that stuff. We do think. So it's, a lot of it is an inferiority. It's not about the arguments. Okay, Richard Dawkins wrote a book that's called The God Delusion, as you know, in 2009 or whenever it was, 2008. He spent the majority of the book just, you know, attacking, attacking, attacking. Moral arguments. And guess how long he spent on the cosmological argument, which you mentioned, which is like the leading argument. He spent five pages. Five pages. Guess how long he spent on the uh, design argument? Two pages. Of a book with hundreds of pages, he spent two, I counted it. Two pages. You can read it in five minutes. He didn't want to engage with it because he didn't want to make mistakes. He knew he was not a philosopher. He knew that he would get humiliated. So he said, the less I say, the better. Which is what I should implement in marriage. That's a different story. <laughs> Maybe... Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that, that was some conversation we had. But the point is, if you look at not just the New Atheist Movement, but the Shubuhat, the doubts that people, young people, are given by the dominant ethic and the population is to do with women's rights in Islam. It's to do with the hudud, the, the, the punishments, all of these kinds of things. And what's that got to do with atheism? Nothing. There is, and this is important, it's going to sound a bit technical, but let me just break it down for you. There is no necessary link between atheism and liberalism. Liberalism is an ideology which can be described through the harm principle. That you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else, which is why they believe in homosexuality. Nowadays, they say a man and a man, they can do what they want, leave them alone. And you say to them, why? 
They say, because so long as they're not harming anyone else, why are you getting involved in their business? I'm sorry to say, I say, what about a brother and a sister? I know there's young people here. They say, no, it's not the same. I say, why not? It's the same principle. But it's, they don't want to be consistent with it. They realize the implications. But the point is, most of the shubuhat, the doubts, the doubts that they have are from this paradigm. They're coming from this. Or a second wave feminist paradigm. And the second wave feminist paradigm says that men and women should be equal in every single thing. I was reading a book called The Communist Manifesto, written by a woman called, uh, I forget her first name, but her surname is Ngozi. She's Nigerian. She's not that bad, actually, to be honest. She made a very famous speech. She wrote a book called The Feminist Manif Manifesto. And in that book called The Feminist Manifesto, she said that men and women should be, there should be absolute equality between men and women in everything except for breastfeeding. Because why? Because it's impossible, Yanni. It's impossible to do breastfeeding, Yanni, as a man. Although now they're trying to like create prosthetic breasts and this and that. Unfortunately, some of our men have their own set of breasts and all that already. But there's no milk in them. The point is, it's, it's, it's impossible. So she said, you know, that's, that is what it is. The, que the, the question we should be asking, and no, before I say the question we should be asking, is I will say, with that paradigm, with that understanding that, okay, men and women should be equal. Now the Muslim in Ramadan is reading the Quran. He's the first day, second day, third day, and the fourth day is reading Surah Al-Nisa. You'll see Allahu fi awladikum li mithlu hazil that you know for the yani the the man the boy has twice the amount of inheritance as the girl. And this is only in the case of brother and sister, by the way. This, yani it's a long story, but brothers get twice as much as sisters. Otherwise, otherwise the mother and the father get the same. The man. Anyway, long story. They are saying they'll say something to the effect of. Well, that goes against the principle I've learned, which is what? There should be equality between men and women. Therefore, and for Allah, that's what they think. Therefore, the Quran is wrong. That's what they think. Why? Because what is right is that men and women should be treated equally and the same. The Quran is saying there should be disparity. Therefore, the Quran is wrong. But they don't say that, they think it. And this is where it's, it's called shak. When you have doubts, severe doubts in the religion of Islam. And then they start developing real problems in their face and pain and all kinds of problems. But why? It's because they have what you call capitulated. They have given up to the assumption. The assumption being that men and women should be the same in all cases. But this is a false assumption or at least an unsubstantiated assumption. This assumption itself cannot be proven. You know, Plato... Famously, Aristotle claims, in fact, Aristotle is Plato's student. He says, like things should be treated the same thing. Uh, like should be treated for like. Meaning, the different things should be treated differently. Different things should be treated differently. You, what year are you in, brother? Nine. You're nine. And what year are you, a young man? Year two. Now, imagine if you were in class and I gave you the same work to do. I'm sure he's clever, but he's not that, maybe not that clever. <laughs> Well, what year are you in, brother? Nine. You're nine as well. But I think you'd still struggle if I gave you the same work. I'm only joking. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only kidding. The, the same thing is, we even have sets. You go to a school. I'm only kidding, bro. You know, I don't, I'm just playing. You go to school and they have sets. Set one, set two, set three. You know, and they make a special set for this brother here. <laughs> <laughs> and They make sense because you can't treat this, it's, this is not equity. Like, you know, you go on the bus, yeah? You go on the bus. And you know, you see this kind of thing that comes down for the wheelchair. Why do you think they put it there? I, have, you, have you ever seen a situation where someone is using it, like a person on a wheelchair, and then someone comes out and says, that's not fair. <laughs> why, are you, why are you bringing the ramp out for him and not for me? Have you ever seen that situation? Why? Because we all, it's almost intuitive. We know that this person needs a bit of help. Because they're disabled. Okay, so this person has something different to this person, and we cater for it. No, no problem. No problem. How about this one? How about... They say they want, they want equality of outcome and equality of opportunity. Both are false, by the way. Both are absolutely false. Let me give you an example of uh, uh, equality of, not just outcome, opportunity being false. Going back to a bus... Like a double-decker bus. You don't have double-deckers here, do you? 
You don't need them. <laughs> you have a double decker bus. Okay. So I apply. So, you know, you apply. How old are you? You don't have a driving license. Next year, the year is 17, right? You can get a. And then a blind man applies. A blind man applies to be a bus driver. Is, and they have, let's say, they, they, he became blind thereafter. He's got all the qualifications that are required. And then he gets called into the interview. And he says, I have, to have, I have a secret to tell you. He, you know, I'm blind. Or I'm, I'm, I can't see with this eye or I have a problem with my vision. Should he get the job? No, he shouldn't get the job. Of course not. But, but isn't this against equality of uh, opportunity? Yes, it is. A, of course, it is against. We're not even giving you an opportunity because if you have a job, you're going to cause problems for the people. They, they say we are born equal. Have you heard this? It's in their founding father. Uh, the founding fathers of liberalism say we're all born equal. We're born equal. How are we born equal? Have you seen the height disparity between me and him? <laughs> <laughs> what equality are we talking about here? I make up for it intellectually. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, mashallah. You see? Born equal? I've got I've got grey hair at the age of 30. Actually, you've got some grey hair as well. I'm, I'm picking up, I'm bullying you now. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I have to choose someone else, another victim. So this man over there is... Is is receding hairline like me as well? I mean, this is with the same age. What the hell is going? There's no equality here. What equality? What equality? Sorry, what, what are you talking? What what do you mean by equality? Has everyone has anyone dared ask that question? We're scared to ask that question. We believe in equality. What you, okay? What do you mean by it? Because we're not the same in height, in age, in color, even in opportunities. I'm I'm born in one place of the world. This guy's born somewhere else. Not everyone gets the opportunity to be a great spokesperson and a great intellectual like Maulana because he's gotten certain opportunities by going to Turkey, by going to this country, by going to that country, going to this university. Not everyone has that opportunity. Someone lives in a village, he has no such opportunity. They might have the potential, but they don't have the opportunity. So there's no equality because where he's born and he's born is different. We're not saying we don't believe in equality. We believe in equality of value, but not identicality of roles. We believe in equality of value that if a Muslim man and a Muslim woman, they do the same thing, they fast, they pray and all that kind of thing, they deserve to, they're equal in the sight of Allah. A black man, he does something, a white man, they're equal in the sight of Allah, of course. We don't believe in that kind of hierarchy. But we don't believe in, okay, that we have to now forge a situation where we create equality everywhere and we pretend there's no differences between men and women. It's nonsense. No difference between, they did this in uh, in America, they were trying to get people to become firefighters, you know, and obviously women are slower than men, average, weaker than men, I'm sorry to you, <laughs> they've also got good things, you know, I'm just, uh, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I mean, th that's the truth, I mean, they, statistically, they've got abil ability to do more than one thing at one time, like multitasking, I know that's very cliche, I understand. But there are things, we, obviously, and they're nurturing, more nurturing than we are. So I had to do two for two, just to go align with the discourse, you know. And they can give birth. And I know that sounds like, oh, so what? No, no, seriously. So the, the only reason why it sounds like ridiculous is because the feminists have rubbished the institution of motherhood and marriage. Oh, a woman can give birth. So what? Yeah, that's, no, no, it's a big deal, you know. Have you ever seen a woman give birth? I had to see it three times. Well, I saw it with my own three children, I mean, my own kids, just in case. <laughs> I mean, you know. But what I'm saying to you is this. That where there's differences and there are continual differences, is a, continu a continuity which exists within women. That, and there's a continuity, a collective temperamental continuity, which exists within men. Then there should be, for there to be equity, there should be some kind of tailoring of that for that. And we believe Islam provides it, which is why jihad is mandatory for men. And it's not mandatory for women. Fighting, defending the lands and all these kinds of things. There are some things which are mandatory for women that are not mandatory for men. Like, for example, the hijab. 
I mean, we have our own thing that we have to cover, but it's nothing like men. Oh, why? Oh, is it because why do we have to cover for the weakness of men? Why not? Why not? I don't understand. Men can cover for the weakness of women, where they need a fight, a help, and a hand in a fight, and they're firefighting where men are better. And women can fight, help for the weakness of men. We can help for each other's weakness. We believe in a complementarity. We believe in the relationship of symbiotic complementarity, meaning al-alaqa al which is we help each other, we cover for each other. My weakness is your strength. Your strength is my weakness. What's the problem? You guys watch football, yeah? Who watch football? Maybe cricket. Maybe I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> well, what do you want? Football, yeah? You know, you have a goalkeeper, don't you? You have a goalkeeper, you have a striker, yeah? You have a midfielder. You play football as well? Okay. You play football? Who plays? Put your hand up to play football. You? Which one? Okay, yeah. What's your position? Goalkeeper. It's very important. Imagine a football match without a goalkeeper. I'm left back, actually. Left back on the bench. <laughs> How can I say? So we have a situation like that. We have a situation where if you, you need every everyone knows their role. No one says, well, how comes he gets to score all the goals? Oh, we need a defender. We need a goalkeeper. In economics, they call it the law of comparative advantage. You can help me out here. He's an economic expert. I have to I have to praise everyone here today. Just to return a compliment. This guy well, like, came to Sapiens last week. And he was, you know, he was hammering this Marxist. He's actually the, the head of the <laughs> Communist Party. I was so shocked. So this, because he comes across as very, you know. But then he, 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 I saw this lion in him. A, he, the, 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 the communist was quaking in his boots. <laughs> so that's why in an economy, you need different things. Specialisms, right? Everyone's a specialist. You have a FBI agent. You have, you know, CID agent. And if you're Pakistani, you have a news agent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm only kidding, guys. But you see, this, that, so the assumption of equality, you like that one, huh? <laughs> you know, it's just it's the, it's the style, it's the wit, it's the eloquence. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, 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 but that's the point. You see, so we believe in specialism. We believe in difference. We don't agree with the assumption. Do you know in, in English, I used to teach English in schools, by the way, and history as well, before I got fired. <laughs> I got fired for, for some political activity. Um, and what I was going to say was, we used to do something called PEA, or PEE, you guys might have it. Point, example, explanation. Do you remember this? So I'm trying to ta tailor the thing for the, for the youngsters, okay? Because, you know, we can't both be talking high theology, right? <laughs> Marshall. PEE. But when someone asks you a question, just remember something, yeah? This is what I actually use. The first thing you do, someone asks you any question, the framework I use is the APECA. -E I know this might sound like long-winded. A APECA. APECA, yeah? So it's not just PEA or PEE. -E, it's APECA. So how does it work? The first thing you do is you question the assumptions. A for assumptions. You can put this down if you like. It's no problem. This might be the only thing I actually give you of of utility today. Someone speaks to you and they say, well, why is it that your religion says that a man can marry four wives? I don't know why I keep using this example in particular. It's like I'm a, yeah, my religion. Or that a man can marry a Christian and a woman cannot marry a Christian. This is in the Quran, right? So why is it that the Quran discriminates against women in this way? How would anyone here answer this question? Before you tell me, let me give you the framework, all right? The first thing you do is A for assumption. So every question has an assumption. What is the assumption of this question? If I ask you, why is it that a man can marry four and a woman can't? What is the assum a possible assumption of this question? Yeah. So that, that, it may, that that's aberrational, anti-normative or wrong even. Or that... It's that there should be equality. There should be an equality to begin with between men and women in all cases. If you don't question the assumption, you lose the argument. Full stop. You lose it. If you say, oh, because this, but women are given rights elsewhere, whatever answer you give, if you do not question the assumption of the shubha, 
And the assumption always goes back, like 95% of the time, to either feminism or liberalism. Okay? The assumption will go back to those two things. So you can, you can put it in your mind like that. Yes, any shubha, any misconception anybody has, it goes back to feminism or liberalism. Not atheism. Atheism has nothing to offer. Atheism is an empty barrel. Atheism is nothing. As, as the sheikh, he said, he said correctly, or the maulana, he said correctly, wallahi, it's, it's a very good point. He said, uh, agnostics, he said that it's like saying I'm jahil. They're saying I don't know. So if you don't know, why are you asking me any question? You don't know anything. Imagine someone who says I don't know, and then he's telling you what to believe in. If you get, what do you believe? I'm an agnostic. So why is it that your religion says this? Well, you, you said you don't know. <laughs> so well, why are you so certain about something, you know? If you're an agnost, if you're atheist, you, you don't actually have, by necessity, any moral stance. You can, you, can be an, you can be an atheistic fascist, Nazi. It's true. They're not incompatible. So, atheism is not the issue here. The head of the snake, there's two heads. If there were two heads, it would be second wave feminism and liberalism. And if there was one of the two, it would be liberalism. You need to know what this ideology is. So, the assumption is that there should be an equality between men and women. And that there's that identity, uh, identicality and value or equality of value equals identicality in roles, that like things should be treated the same. That's the assumption. <coughs> now, how do we deal with that assumption? We say, you prove it now. That's your assumption. You see how easy that was? It's like you're playing tennis. He, he bats a ball to you, and you get you freak out. You just bat it back. Now he has to bat it to you. In other words, now you say to him what? You say to him, what's your proof? One question, simple. What's your proof <coughs> that... Men and women should be treated equally in all cases. And whatever they say back, you say, whatever they say, you just say, look, is that on an objective level? So you're saying whatever you've just said there explains that men and women should be treated equally objectively. Yani meaning the same level as two plus two equals four. The same level as that. And if they say yes, then you can just say you're wrong and explain why not. But it's impossible for them to prove that assumption. So the first thing in the in the in the framework was A for a, for the framework is APECA, by the way, yeah. A is assumption. Then P is now you make your point, like PEA or PEE. -E. You make your own point. And then E is what? No, before that. Example. So you bring some stats, you bring some points. You, you, you must make sure you use this in school. Yeah. Very good, very good framework. So you say assumption, point. Evidence or uh, uh, example, give some example. Now the C stands for counterexample. Some may say, and you think, what would they say back to you? This will work everywhere except for in marriage. <laughs> I've tried it. Uh, well, I, well, for nine years I've been trying. <laughs> Why didn't you do this and that? Well, the assumption is. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. You can't win a logical argument with your spouse. Just the moment you've argued with your spouse, you've lost. And no, there's been times where I've really, I think I, like in my mind, I won. Like I, I won. If there was a crowd, they would be cheering for me. Be. But <laughs> Wallahi. Yeah. Wallahi. However, I look to my left and she's like, you know, not in a very good mood. <laughs> I say, what have I really won now? <laughs> No one, I get no money from this. <laughs> I get no web from this. I get nothing from this. So don't, you know, don't do this with your parents either. You have to be good with your parents. And you have to be good with the elders of your community. Because they're the ones who, their hard sweat, blood and tears, they allowed us to be here in the first place. So you can't be messing around. They're using these kind of things to go and attack you, your, your parents and elders. But A, P, E, C is for counterexample. And then A is analysis which is like explanation, yeah? It's like PEE. -E. And if you have a framework always in mind, someone asks you any question, assumption. Okay, the assumption is X, Y, Z. Then the point you make, then believe me, they will never win. So just to conclude here, just to conclude, we have, like the Sheikh said, and I, uh, I'm not mentioning lots of things because he's already mentioned. We have a with tradition, we have the answers. They have actually no answers. They're not a big threat. They're weak. They're weak. Intellectually, they're, they're laughed at in universities. On social media, they're not even doing that well. Their books are not selling. You know, uh, they're actually suffering. 
They're going through serious depression in this country because they don't have meaning in their lives. Serious anxiety, depression. They have nothing. They don't have meaning. I was having a conversation just to conclude with, with a particular like medical expert. And he, I was, he said to me, you know, I, I said, what do they now like recommend for depression, chronic depression? And chronic depression is different to transient sadness and all these kinds of things, which is different to grief and all these emotions are different. He said the first thing, but now they've changed the guidance, the NHS, the first thing they actually um, recommend is exercise, which is interesting. It's no longer what you call SSRIs, like tablets and stuff that they take. Yeah, They, they say go and do exercise. I said they're going to keep failing. And to be fair, I think Jordan Peterson and other psychologists have realized this, which is why they wrote the book called Map. The first book he actually ever wrote was called Maps of Meaning. The first thing that should be recommended to somebody who has depression is to go and find purpose in life. And it can't just be a subjective purpose. It's, it has to be grounded in reality. And we don't know how fortunate we are to have that in the religion of Islam. Because, oh, wallahi, I think to myself, uqsum billah, uqsum billah. I, I was just in a message yesterday. And I was praying. I was like, you know, praying and this and that. <laughs> That's what people do in the message. And then I was just sitting afterwards and I was thinking, imagine if I was an atheist. May Allah protect us and all of us from, from such a thing. But what would I be thinking? Because if, if, you're an, if you're an atheist, there's two things. I'd be always thinking, I want to minimize the pain of my life and maximize the pleasure. I just want to do things that are the most fun thing that I could potentially do at all times. But if you have that mentality, every moment that you're not spending in great excitement is a moment lost. And therefore, your expectations are, are right here. You will never feel like you're achieving what you need to achieve in this world. And therefore, that is, it makes your susceptibility to depression so much higher than someone who believes that life is a test. Because we believe that the, the purpose of life is to worship Allah and that life is a test, we don't have this problem because pain is actually meaningful to us. Imagine you are an atheist that has cancer and that the doctor tells you you have two days to live. What are you going to do? What are you going to think in yourself? Uh, well, I'm say goodbye to my friends. I'm going to be nothing in a second. And I'm going to go back to being nothing. I'm going to switch off like a television. But for the believer, they think this is just the beginning. It's it, it, I'm not saying therefore God exists once again. But what I am saying, we do have arguments for God's existence. I've written an entire book about it. We've done a series on it. But that's not the forum for today. The point is, that being an atheist, a liberal, a secularist, a materialist, and all these other isms, it doesn't give you happiness in life. It doesn't give you meaning in life. It makes you depressed. It makes you sad. It ruins you. So we have to be very, very grateful that we believe in Allah and that we believe in a system like Islam, which is the perfect system. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.